Um, and it is always a, a sort of a, a, a privilege to be invited to do these type of lectures. So thank you to everyone for coming, both colleagues, friends, and even family. So <laughs> from the back over here. Sorry, bring my back. Um, so I guess uh, my hope uh, in this sort of session is to sort of bridge some of that interface between education and therapy. Um, and really sort of highlight some of that area around humanistic psychology and thinking about multidisciplinary working, which is, I suppose, at the heart of a lot of what we've been doing in the counselling psychology programme. When I came up with the title, uh, a number of things hadn't happened. So uh, things have shifted a little bit since then. So the first one is that uh, Laura, myself and Kim Burrell have created a... Uh, um, have finished a report sort of around the impact of supporting the way that schools support um, students in the current socio-political climate, I guess. So looking at the way that um, professional staff in schools um, work around emotional well-being uh, in the context of austerity. And then the other thing that happened sort of last week was this green paper uh, emerged around looking at the mental health provision uh, of children within um, schools in particular. And so I'm going to kind of uh, tailor it a little bit to sort of um, add them into the dimension, uh, into this presentation. So I had these different, these are my different areas. So do I buy paper pants or professionals? Um, so some concerns that schools have. Um, something bad is going to happen. So a reflection on the current situation from my perspective. Hello. Um, there's nothing wrong with snowflakes, so this is my seasonal contribution. <laughs> um, but I'll get to that in a minute. So that's an introduction to humanistic psychology. I see humans, but not humanity. So thinking about how humanistic principles might apply in the educational setting. Um, and then um, the final one, thinking about the green paper in particular um, and how... Um, I don't know, hopefully some of my thoughts will at least act as a provocation for you to think about what your ideas about it might be as well. Uh, so if I start, and I realise I'm talking this way <laughs> to most people, and there's a, an omission of people that way. Um, so do I buy pants or professionals? Paper pants or professionals? So this is a report that Laura and Kim and myself have been involved in. Um, and this, this project really focused on looking at how um, schools are currently working <laughs> to support the social and emotional well-being of young people. Our aims were to look at what types of professionals are working in that setting, what activities they're covering, um, what the rationale for professionals doing the work that they do is, and then thinking about, well, what's the impact of the current situation? So the first three I'm going to do very quickly, so really treading on relatively well-trodden ground. So we asked the senior leaders in three schools in Manchester to sort of identify who was involved in supporting the emotional well-being of um, pupils and we come up with these lists um, that we then went and chased to interview. It was interesting just looking at the spread of them um, that they cover senior leadership, they cover newly qualified teachers, heads of years and then more specific roles like SENCO, so special education needs coordinators, um, and pastoral team leaders within the school setting, and then outside of the school setting there were a lot of services that were also bought in. So sexual health workers, uh, workers around um, working with different cultural groups in particular, counsellors, CAMS workers, ed site, school nurses. Interestingly it was those that kind of, the ones that were underlined are the people that we didn't get to interview because they were too busy um, to kind of contribute at that point in time. The different activities that we sort of identified, so people were sort of talking about undertaking with young people, went from everything that was very soft, um, so thinking about things like rela developing relationships with them, um, um, and role modelling, so these very soft kind of uh, approaches to more targeted interventions that may have inv included things like counselling but also mentoring on a one-to-one -one basis, um, whole school interventions um, that were uh, approaches that kind of incorporated every member of the um, student population. And then this other kind of caveat came up which was a question around well, what is emotional well-being more generally? So this was just one of the quotes from uh, one of the professionals we interviewed where they were talking about 
We have a uniform bank where students can go uh, if situations like that arise. So they were really getting into that sort of question of, well, well-being wasn't just about psychological well-being or emotional well-being. It was really bridging this more holistic kind of view. Um, and I think that was an important sort of element of the stories that people were telling us. The other elements, I think, were, were kind of relatively commonplace in the literature, and this, this other dimension kind of came up. So why? Um, so why were people doing that? So there was some, again, relatively standard things. Uh, one was around sort of supporting access to learning, um, and the other thinking about supporting a more holistic growth. Um, so we had quotes like, they can't attain if they're not feeling safe. It's Maslow's triangle. It was interesting, almost the psychology <laughs> sort of nature of uh, the quotes as well, um, isn't it? If they, feel, uh, if they don't feel safe, looked after, nurtured, school's the last thing on the list. Um, so there's that sort of element that actually supporting the emotional well-being of these young people will contribute to their ability to access learning. Um, and then this other type of comment, which was really about sort of providing a time to be. So rather than doing, it was sort of really trying to enhance that sort of um, time in the here and now. So and I'm going to try and give a number of quotes from these people, because I think it's always, for me, it's always important when people have kind of taken part in research projects that we try to almost prize uh, their contributions. So in terms of this sort of question, do uh, professionals believe that their work has changed as a context of austerity? It's a very simple answer, and that was yes. <laughs> um, so the different elements that came up here were um, some of that perceived increase in deprivation of the current context, um, the impact of specific welfare reform uh, and disability support um, that people were receiving or families were receiving, the limited funding available to so schools and the limited funding uh, that was perceived to be available to those organisations outside of schools, and then also this other element that sort of captured some of the current context where some of the um, the professionals we were talking to were identifying that um, current policy changes or the EU um, referendum vote also added to the concerns of children and young people in schools. So as this is in the bit considering resources, I thought this was just to give you an example of the, the type of messages and the type of thoughts that um, people were sharing with us. Um, so this came from um, an uh, assistant head from one of the schools. So they've decimated the service, but if we wanted, to, uh, wanted a school nurse, we could buy one. It wouldn't increase our budget. It would have to come from somewhere else. Educational psychologists, we buy in. Again, it's not changed the headline figure, but it's a service that now, um, we now buy that historically was available through the local authority. Lollipop lady, man, that's a service that you now have to buy as a school. The things like, you know, the slashing children's services budgets and the support that's available, it's all coming down to school. We've just employed another person to work alongside me to take that work. Um, that early, in, uh, early help, um, help work, but historically that would have been done by children's services and family support workers, and they're just not there. Um, and this was kind of a common thread in the work in some ways. But then in thinking about that, I suppose academically, there's always been a a little bit of a division about well, what is education for? So this is a quote from history, and I'll ask you kind of if you can recognize where it comes from, if anyone knows it. So at present, opinion is divided about the subjects of education. People do not take the same position about what should be learned by the young, either with a view of excellence or with a view to the best life. Nor is it clear whether their studies should be mainly directed to the intellect or the moral character. Any guesses? <laughs> No. Pliny the Younger. <laughs> Who do you think? Pliny the Younger. Pliny the Younger. Pliny the Younger. <laughs> we go, it goes back a fair way. So it goes back to Aristotle. <laughs> so I think these questions about kind of well, what's the purpose of education, what do we value, where do we take it, are, are, you know, they're quite intrinsic into this question. You know, and you can kind of see manifestations of it. Now bringing a little bit more modern into the sort of hashtags around, you know, what would you cut? 
You know, in some ways, those discussions and dialogues seem to be getting into that question of, well, what is the most valuable elements of, um, that we uh, should be offering within school? So that's the end of my first part. And in thinking about that, that's where I get into this sort of this sense of, well, something bad is going to happen. So why do I say that? Um, I guess, so this is something that, a very simple message that seemed to be coming through. Um, and I've very stripped it down. <laughs> so that the perception of the staff members we talked to was very much around the idea that there was an increasing need and a decrease in provision. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that something bad's going to happen. However, they also talked about this. They talked about a limited training and support in the work that they do. So my day-to-day -day role is training counsellors, psychotherapists, counselling psychologists. Um, there's a few of you around here today, which is nice to see. Um, and we spend a lot of time talking about, well, what does that mean? And how do you look after yourself? And how do you look after the people that you're looking after? Um, and that's a very complex world. Um, it has an impact upon the people you're working with and yourself. Um, it's no surprise, given the current context, that the attrition rates of teachers are very high, the burnout rates of teachers are very, very high, and you would anticipate that, that the culmination of all of that kind of um, context is going to end up in something bad happening. <laughs> Anyway, that's where I, how I will summarise it. Now there is, there is a reality check in here. So um, if, we're, if we're actually sort of making the assertion that things are getting worse and young people's lives are becoming more complex, um, we're not actually sure that that's the case. I think Neil Humphreys, uh, who's at the back, is Sarah Field and really sort of looked at this in some more depth around the idea of, well, have things got worse for young people? Um, and I, I guess there's a big question that maybe things haven't got worse, but at the same time there is an acknowledgement that there is an awful, an awful lot of work that we can do to support this group. Um, so, you know, typically this is, a, this is an infographic from Public Health England from 2015. These statistics get rolled out time and time again. So, one in ten young people experience mental health issue at any one time. So that's three people within every classroom. Um, seven are likely to have been bullied, one could have experienced the death of a, death of a parent, etc, etc. These sort of figures generally sort of say that there's, there's an awful lot that go on in this, this population's life. There's also a very strong economic argument, uh, which I'll come back to at some point, which sort of reflects that the impact of all of this um, distress has um, an impact upon the productivity of the country in its long term. This isn't a realm that I particularly sort of like to go into hugely, but I guess that um, projections look at the idea that 50, or report the idea that 50% of mental health problems are established by the age of 14 and 75% by the age of 24. So this obviously sort of gathers momentum on a political um, kind of layer, and we end up with reports galore. So I don't know if people know these. So this is uh, the Department of Health kind of promoting the idea of future in mind, which is about the idea of trying to um, trying to bring, well, how to say it, sort of use schools as a hub for mental health support in particular, I think is one of the key messages they're doing. So, so the counselling in schools, uh, blueprint for the future from the Department of Education, and um, likewise mental health and behaviour in schools. So there's the Department of Health and Department of Education are both interested in this area. We've got teacher training, sort of um, the Carter Review, which uh, I know some people <laughs> <laughs> would view as the pantomime uh, villain of the, <laughs> the pictures, um, would highlight the need for teachers to be more informed about mental health. And likewise, there's a... Um, this kind of move to kind of train people up, train teaching staff up in mental health first aid. Uh, we're also very fortunate to have our dear Prime Minister of the time supporting the mental health agenda um, and kind of in this bit here, they're one of the, with an emphasis on early intervention for children and young people. Um, so whether or not we agree with the politics, it's interesting that there is a sort of a real thrust of interest in kind of uh, seeing this agenda 
pushed. And this is where we, where we come to last week, if I'm right. <laughs> Can anyone? It was last week, wasn't it, Neil? Well, this was released. So this Transforming Children and Young People's Mental Health Provision, uh, a green paper. So really thinking about what the, um, what the impact of all of this political movement might look like. So the, the suggestions talk about the idea of creating a new mental health workforce of community-based mental health support teams. Every school and college will be encouraged to appoint a designated lead for mental health. And there will be a new four-week waiting time for NHS uh, children and young people's mental health services to be piloted in some areas. So I think the, this all looks very good. But I thought what I would share with you is some of the quotes from the, um, the participants in our recent study. Um, and I, don't, I won't interpret at this point in time, but I'll leave it for you to kind of consider you know, how it might sort of square with this information. I did contemplate the idea as we are talking about humanistic education, getting everyone to do a nice relaxation, <laughs> get you in touch with your feelings, and then I'd read these out, but actually I thought that might be a bit excessive. <laughs> Feel free to do it in your own time. <laughs> um, so the first quote, so we used to have a huge, huge pastoral team in school. We had a full-time mental health worker, well, one and a half, a full-time social worker, properly qualified, etc. We had various mentors and so on and so on, and they've all gone, and now we're left with, you know, a few people who are experienced and doing what they can. If you've got mum, your mum, <laughs> If you've got your mum at home crying her eyes out because she's skint, she thinks she's going to be made homeless, that then, means, uh, that then means that young person comes into school with the weight of the world on their shoulders. The bedroom tax caused chaos for loads of our families. You know, because they were suddenly having to pay off all this money and then actually, you know, the government was saying, you can move, you can move to a smaller property. Well, they can't. There aren't any. There is nowhere for anybody to move. There were lots and lots of children, uh, charities, that were lottery funded and local council funded, you know, that you could use in the interim. And they were really good, you know working with families in the area. <coughs> and most of those are non-existent now. They've lost the funding and they've gone. So there's two more. You've stuff coming from the Home Office or the Health Department that this is the school's responsibility, but you're not getting that reflected in this is a priority and this is a priority <coughs> and yet that priority is not necessarily measured in terms of what Ofsted would look for, in terms of judging a school. It's not always what's looked for in terms of when DFE guidance comes out. I'm not a social worker. I was never trained to be a social worker. And sometimes what I wonder, how much of my job falls into that, you know. I'm a teacher. I'm an English teacher. That was my starting point, but most of my work now is around pastoral needs, and that's quite telling, I think. So these were just a number of the quotes that came from the, the schools, three schools in Manchester, that were talking about the impact of the current socio-economic climate on their work. For me, I think there's an interesting shift between this maybe, the rhetoric that we're getting that mental health is important, and high on the sort of agenda of policy makers and the actual reality of what the teachers are telling us the, or the professionals working in schools are telling us. And I'll return to that in a minute. At this point, I'll have a little bit of a Christmassy <laughs> element. So this is where we kind of move. We sort of shift into a slightly different area. So thinking, um, there's nothing wrong with snowflakes. Um, so firstly, I suppose, does anyone, 
Does anyone know what a snowflake is? One near. So we're talking like generation snowflake. Generation snowflake, yeah. So, uh, do you want to say more? Um, <laughs> as I understand it, the view that the current generation of children and young people are um, somehow too vulnerable, too easily offended, just, yeah, snowflakes, very, very yeah. easy to damage. Yeah, and I think there's that general view that both the young people and the generation itself might be viewed as snowflakes in that sense. Does anyone know where that comes from? Michael, do you know where that comes from? <laughs> Michael, you know where that comes from? <laughs> <laughs> Promise you Fight Club, we have Fight Club. <laughs> so this often... So, <laughs> so Fight Club, I guess, is... <laughs> You are not special. You are not a beautiful or unique snowflake. You are the same decaying organic matter as everything else. So this was the voice that sort of talked to the key character in Fight Club. Um, and I guess it's been sort of used as a kind of a way of sort of challenging this idea that people are being too sentimental or too precious in who they are. Interestingly, for me, I think this idea of being unique and sort of prizing the humanity um, echoes quite well with humanistic psychology. <laughs> so, so I would say I'm a proud snowflake. I'm happy to wave my placards, read my Guardian and stand in front of you and say that aloud. <laughs> <laughs> Completely undermining a lot of my arguments. <laughs> um, so what is humanistic psychology? So humanistic psychology, it developed with the discontent of existing models. So thinking about uh, psychoanalysis in particular, the work of Freud, and behavioral, behaviorism, the work of Skinner. Um, it was described as the third force in psychology, so Bugenthal, James Bugenthal in the 60s um, articulated it in that way. Um, and it slowly grew uh, as during, primarily in America, but as a, an amalgamation of work between um, particularly European exiles, um, in America at that time, an American psychologist. So we had people like Rollo May, Abraham Maslow, um, Charlotte Bruner, uh, Fritz Perls, and Carl Rogers were key elements or key people in the evolution of humanistic psychology. And I think that this statement says quite a lot in what it doesn't say. So Humanistic Psychology, the Journal of Humanistic Psychology is being founded by a group of psychologists and professional men and women from other fields who are interested in those human capacities and potentials that have no systematic place either in positivistic or behavioristic theory or in classical psychoanalytic theory. So for me what's interesting is it's, a, it's an alliance of people who say we are not that but it doesn't say what we are. Um, and I think things have moved on. Um, it was interesting, sort of one of the first books that maybe kind of links to this was written by Rollo May. Um, so, The Art of Counseling. So in 1932, uh, when this was published, um, and the question that this book begins with is, what is a human? Um, and I think for me, that's sort of, it, it, I know our training counselling psychologists who are here, so this is a question that we sort of start our course with in some ways as well. It's really question, well, if we can understand this, what this is, then we can understand what we're trying to do with it um, or work with in that sense. So there is this sort of existential dimension that often gets aligned to humanistic psychology and sometimes you see people talk about humanistic existential approaches. Um, Following this, however, people came up with these five postulates. Um, I'm not going to go through each one in turn. I'm going to focus on these three. So, in terms of the way that um, humanistic psychology talks about um, the human is sort of focusing in on its ability to grow, the fact that it's unique and complex, um, and that we have choice and agency. So if we talk about growth, Carl Rogers talked about, does anyone recognise what that is? I had to change my picture, but <laughs> it's a potato. <laughs> Just wondered if there was any horticultural types here. 
But it's a potato growing. Carl Rogers talked about the idea that we are all organisms. Um, and a potato is an organism, and if you put it in a dark room, it will grow to a shard of light. It will try to self-actualize and reach its potential. Um, and he would say that we are organisms, and that given the right environment, um, we too would grow and reach our potential. So Carl Rogers was very much of this sort of, he's very positively minded, uh, or positively minded humanistic psychologist. Um, he wasn't, he wasn't all, that wasn't always the case for humanistic psychologists, and I think this is a beautiful dialogue between Carl Rogers and Martin Buber, which sums up some of their differences. Um, so Carl Rogers, man is basically good, Martin Buber, man is basically good and evil. <laughs> um, could talk about that loads, but we won't. <laughs> Uh, the next bit, thinking about the person being unique. So this is where we really get into snowflake territory. Um, so this, have, pe uh, has, have people heard the parable of the, the elephant and the blind man? Some people nodding. So humanistic, one of the postulates of humanistic psychology is the idea that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. As psychologists, we love the sum of the, <laughs> we love the parts. We break people up constantly, um, and humanistic psychology tried to say, well, actually, what about what about this whole? Um, so in this parable, um, there were, I think it's six blind men. Yes, yeah, six blind men, and they were asked to identify the object in front of them. The first person goes up to the object, touches it, it's wiggling around. He says, well, it's a snake. Um, second person goes up to him and goes, you must be wrong, it's really hard and thin. Um, and he says, it's a spear. And this goes on, we have a fan, a wall, some uh, tree trunks, and a rope. And it's only when those men put that together um, that there's a real sense of actually the object in front of them is an elephant. And I think it's quite a nice idea of sort of thinking about, well, what are we doing when we start breaking people into these components? Are we missing the object in front of us? Um, and then the final one, this idea of choice and agency. Um, so, and I, I couldn't get a nice picture for this, but this was quite a good quote. Uh, one of the main endeavours of humanistic therapists is to strengthen clients' beliefs that they can be the authors of their own lives. And it's interesting when you, when you, when you talk to kind of therapists or you talk to organisations that are really championing this idea of agency, um, Oh, what am I thinking? Yeah, it's very difficult. I think sometimes people feel they have no choice um, and they don't have that opportunity. And I think trying to prize that and demonstrate that becomes incredibly important. Some of the work, I was talking to someone who works for Reclaim, the organization working with young people in Manchester, and they were saying that they were working in, I'm pretty sure it's Rochdale, I'm sorry if I've got that wrong, where they were talking about all these disenfranchised young people and then they were um, trying to work in a very democratic way with that group of people. Um, and that it just proved so important to give people that opportunity and that choice and to see that their views could have an impact on actually the um, influencing uh, the organisation, etc. Anyway, that side, sidestep again. Uh, in terms of what this might look like, so from a therapy perspective, in 1942, Carl Rogers talked about this sort of as um, its ethos. So the counselling relationship is one of which warmth and acceptance in the absence of coercion and personal pressure on the part of the counsellee permits the maximum expression of feelings, attitudes and problems by the counsellee. So it's primarily about the relationship. And he talked about, he came up with these six uh, necessary and sufficient conditions of therapeutic personality change. Um, again, I won't go through all six of them. <laughs> the three that often get talked about as the core conditions um, are an empathic kind of uh, relationship, so understanding the other who you're working with, um, an acceptance and understanding, again, the other, um, and a genuineness on the part of the, um, the therapist. So if these are offered, his view was if these are offered to an individual and that that individual can perceive and accept some of them, then some positive change or constructive change will happen. And he went as far as to say no other conditions are necessary. If these six conditions exist and continue over a period of time, this is sufficient. 
the process of constructive personality change will follow. Um, and one of, the, one of the things we do in our training when we're working with therapists is, is we try and take away a lot of those kind of, we try to get people to at least begin, use this as a starting point. Become familiar with yourself in relation to the other so that then when you're working with those people, um, you at least have a sense of what is happening to you. Um, which is easier, easier said than done. I think we often get, we get pulled into trying to use these techniques and methods which actually are sometimes more about us than they are about the other people. We want to be the heroic therapist rather than actually supporting the person. But in humanistic terms, this, there is a whole range of humanistic therapists, some of which are more active than others. So this is Fritz Perls' Gestalt Therapy, I thought it was useful to also flag this up. It's interesting having Warren in here. This will be one you know. <laughs> so Albert Ellis, so one of the key proponents of cognitive behavioral therapy, one of his first books about rational emotive uh, therapy was called Humanistic Psychotherapy. Uh, the work that we've recently been doing around pluralistic framework, or the pluralistic framework, uh, would identify as having a humanistic base, but it would also involve um, some uh, more proactive work on behalf of the therapist. So this is, this is where we kind of come to, well, what are, what are we trying to do? And this is the lesser known banana rama principle. So what's the most well-known banana pr rama principle? So I want a bit of audience participation. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't what you do. It's the way <laughs> I feel I should make you do that louder, but then, then uh, it's not a <laughs> pantomime. All right, so the lesser known one, um, probably the B-side that never really took off, was, well, no, it's not the way you do it. It's the reason behind you do it, <laughs> why you do it. So really thinking about your motivations. And as a therapist, um, some of the work that we've been doing is it's, it's not necessarily the activity that we're undertaking with people, but our thinking behind that and the intentions that we have in there. It's being slightly playful and summarising in a very crude way here. <laughs> So, now how does this apply to education? So this is where we got to, I see humans, uh, but not humanity. And I've made it festive, again, <laughs> we have baubles. Um, and then we go downhill from there. We have nuclear <laughs> disaster. So humanistic psychologists, when they were first writing, a lot of the initial writings were concerned with the destruction of humanity. Uh, so when you read a lot of the original proponents, they often come back to this. There's a lot of talk about Russia. <laughs> and it's interesting seeing the sort of the present day context of where the fears and the kind of context are, because I think some of this discussion seems to be coming back. Uh, we now have a big strand in humanistic psychology which is also looking at ecological um, kind of environmental issues. Another issue that was around was the robot. <laughs> So, and this really touched on education. Um, so, B.F. Skinner, um, the behavioural psychologist, um, talked about the simple fact is that as a mere reinforcing mechanism, the teacher is out of date. Uh, mechanical and electrical devices must be used. <laughs> this is great, I love that. <laughs> um, the, the humanistic psychology response uh, was slightly different, so a little bit more tempered, but still an interesting one. So machines and computers will have their place and assistants, aides or technicians will be employed to supervise the interaction of students with them. Teachers will then be concerned with the human relations aspect of the curriculum, which cannot be taught or learned by machines. And I, I think this is interesting when you think about how classrooms work now and what is the primary role that's going on there. You know, when my kid comes home and he said he's watched Bob the Builder all day or whatever it is, um, he's young, <laughs> just to say that. Um, and the, the teachers have kind of, uh, kind of let him either use some technological resource or watch a film. Um, it's interesting, well, what's the role in the teacher there? Is it about almost... Uh, I'll use this purposely, provocatively for one person in the audience, is it to curate the educational process? <laughs> um, so so there's this, I think it, it really gets into, well, what are we doing? And what are we doing when we create a green paper that says mental health should be an activity that schools take ownership of? Um, 
So we carry on a little bit in terms of the history and the bridge. So Rogers, Carl Rogers, who we mentioned before, also talked about education. Um, so he talked about it, this book called Freedom to Learn. Uh, and this is a quote I put on the, the flyer uh, before. So to my mind, the best of education would produce a person similar to the one produced by the best of therapy. So really trying to sort of see that there are parallels and um, really thinking, actually, the educational process, you know, when we look at the critical pedagogies literature and about the kind of the idea of facilitating growth and having learners rather than students, there are lots of parallels between the work of Rogers. Um, so the goal being to support self-actualization and support people to become fully functioning people. You know, it really questions what we're trying to get out of education. Um, and he took his idea, uh, he took it very far. <laughs> So people might have heard of encounter groups and where people would have these unstructured groups and really learn about each other uh, or learn about um, subjects in that sort of context. They took off to a point, but they, they never carried on. But you can kind of see remnants of them within certain training activities. Um, and things like inquiry-based learning echo some of that um, sentiment, I would say. But for Rogers, it wasn't that difficult of a, a leap. So Rogers was a, a student of um, uh, one of John Dewey's um, direct, um, well, one of John Dewey's students. So John Dewey was a psychologist who also talked about education and promoted democratic learning. And you can really see that actually Rogers' ideas are just another extrapolation of, um, of Dewey's work, really, in a different context. You had other people like Abraham Maslow, so people know him from the hierarchy of needs, talks about the job of the psychotherapist or the teacher is to help the person find out what's already in him rather than reinforce him or shape or teach him in a prearranged form, which someone else has decided upon in, uh, in advance, so a priori. So there was this real acknowledgement that there was a bridge between, well, what is learning and what are we doing in that? Is it that banking model where we're filling people up or is it that more facilitated model where people will grow? Um, I forgot why I put this one on, but I quite liked it, did it? It was sort of a history of humanistic learning from uh, education, from people like Carl Rogers, through to this kind of idea of learning, um, learning centered instruction, which is uh, one of the areas that I think we've kind of got into and where people have tried to um, develop Carl Rogers' ideas uh, for a more contemporary view. But some of the challenges are kind of, where well, you get into this, so nor is it clear whether their studies should be mainly directed to the intellect or the moral character. So is it about intellectual development or educate, um, emotional content? Now, if we take the Ofsted perspective, Ofsted's changed quite a lot recently to really emphasize um, the educational aspect of things. People talk about the well-being statements almost being whitewashed from it in uh, recent iterations. But there is a bit of a nonsense to that uh, in the sense that you know, research has shown for many years kind of that that sort of that emotional side is part and parcel of the work itself. And then the other aspect is, well, when we actually look at the more kind of proactive student mod learning model, um, that um, the outcomes from that type of work are very effective. So in this sort of meta-analysis of um, the effectiveness or the outcomes of that type of work, uh, the results showed that correlations had a wide variation, mean correlations, blah de blah, were above average compared with the educational innovations for cognitive and especially um, affective and behavioural outcomes. So there's, there's a currency even sort of from a kind of an outcome study perspective. The other question you might say is, well, is, an in, is it too focused on the individual? Is it really focused on the citizen? So therapy, um, and Rousseau, I don't know why I put that one in, but I do like it as a quote, you know. I, um, must choose between making a man or a citizen, um, which is an interesting sort of philosophical one. You can ponder over a cup of tea afterwards. Uh, so typically, so therapy might focus on the individual and education might focus on larger groups. But again, there was a question here really. Carl Rogers was very interested in um, the kind of political dimension, got very into kind of some of the discussions in the Irish peace process, in fact, but um, was reflected on personal power, his book. Rogers and Freire, so some people bridge some of the ideas in that sense. Very different context, some people highlight that, but um, that's there. And flag up some of Laura's work, because I guess some of the context around really thinking about the impact of social justice within psychologists' um, um, work at this moment, I think is, is increasingly becoming commonplace. 
so on there, I suppose the, the bits that are all emphasized in all of this kind of learning kind of um, environment are that people talk about um, education trying to promote reflectivity, um, dialogue, um, and d democratic learning. So really thinking about people engaging with their own processes and themselves, dialogue with others, um, and really thinking about how we might be different to others uh, and trying to understand that and democ democratic learning so that we're then engaging with society and the broader constructs in there. And this, this is quite different to, you know, in my, my children's <coughs> school, they talk about uh, having a happy side and a sad side. You know, which is sort of, it's, it's a very kind of simplistic way of getting a message across and you can kind of understand it and it sort of follows a very behavioural kind of reinforcement um, kind of model. Um, and I think a lot of schools get into this. You can kind of hear about people having mantras where you kind of start school with a kind of a, a mantra that kind of people have to, um, to say and they have to um, I don't know, be a certain way to be a student in that school. Um, and that seems to go against, I guess, in the humanistic psychology or humanistic education literature, people talk about creativity, critical thinking, reflexivity and freedom. So people trying to make choices and understand themselves in a different way. Um, apart from if it's my children with glitter. <laughs> in which case, they can't do that. So, right, that was a little segue, humanist, that was sort of the lens, I suppose, that I sort of adopted when I was sort of looking at the, that green paper that I mentioned before. And I thought, well, so there's this snowflake bit of me, and kind of thinking, well, what does it make of this, this new document that's been uh, produced? So, I think, firstly, I think there's this element, so let's not ignore the past. So investment in young people's services, mental health services, is clearly needed, my perspective, <laughs> my view. Um, but services have been depleted. So this idea of increasing services and that they haven't been there in the past seems a bit of a nonsense, really. Um, and the calls for additional investment kind of have been made for years as well. So again, this sort of, it seems as if there's a sense in this paper when you read it, they talk about the evidence and they talk about kind of uh, uh, almost this kind of mythical unicorn that never existed. And then all of a sudden it's kind of, we're recreating it. Um, and it leaves me a bit uneasy. As much as I like the message, it still leaves me uneasy. Then there's this sense, well, it's not all about schools. So a rationale for school-based provision, you can easily make that. I think schools are hubs of societies, um, but they're not the only thing. So if we deplete our CAM services, if we remove our youth services, if we omit the idea that um, young people are technologically minded and digital natives, um, then then that to me is a weakness. So this was a quote from some, I was talking to young people who had online therapy and one said, um, oh yeah, part of my life would never, uh, never been discussed, this spelling mistakes are from the text, <laughs> would never been discussed if it was not for online work. Words you can always, um, can't always say face to face to people. That makes sense, uh, uh, that makes sense. Do you find you talk about different stuff online to face to face? So I cried online before, better no one can see you. No one needs to know you're crying and don't need, uh, don't know unless you say. So this, like one of the mantras of our counselling psychology doctorate is pretty much one size doesn't fit all. And this fits with some of that sense of the snowflakey humanistic perspective uh, in me. Uh, the other bit, so it shouldn't come as an additional burden to teaching staff. So who, who is going to do this? And there are kind of talk about developing a workforce, um, but is it teachers, counsellors, psychologists, social workers? Um, the literature highlights how hard multidisciplinary working is, and I think that we haven't thought about that. You know, obviously there will be some sort of um, trialling of different models, but then, then what about how are we going to train these individuals? Supervision seems to be an area that people completely omit a lot of the time, so if we're asking people to do work that has a lot of emotional labour, who's going to support the people who are supporting those people? And then time, you know. I suppose time always comes into things. 
This one, I thought I'd use the four as a means of bridging the four weeks that we have. So four weeks waiting times, well, just bring that on. <laughs> Come on, that'd be great. It does, however, seem a little bit unrealistic if we don't have the resources behind it. Um, and what happens if we overburden the current members of staff? The likelihood is people will move on, uh, etc. Then also there's this sort of idea of, well, we can't, we might be fixate on time, but then if you take a young person's perspective, so when I first went, I didn't really spill everything out. I just got to know her and said hi, and I told her a little bit about myself. Just not about problems or anything, just saying hi and that kind of stuff. So it's not like this magical, we talk, often talk about six weeks of CBT or six weeks of other stuff. Um, I think we also have to give that process time. Um, and if we, I don't know, I'll stop on that. I could go on about that. I'll go through my five points. Uh, work should be informed, not directed by research. So one of the things I noticed in reading this is the only sort of interventions that come up were focused around specifically mentioned CBT and behavioral interventions. Um, this seems to me kind of relatively short-sighted and omitting the kind of the nature of kind of support people might want and thinking about you know our stakeholders being consulted about well what they want stakeholders being students, teachers etc. This was a little graph. We put this in a book and I just kind of liked it. Uh, it's the idea of being research informed so we're not saying ignore the research when they're saying not just do everything the research says, but sit somewhere in the middle. And I think this often represents kind of a position that uh, applied psychologists adopt, so being more informed in that sense. Right. It's 10 to 5. Uh, I've got two more. I've got six and seven to go. I'm not doing too bad in time. So this is not all about schools, family. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I realised why you... <laughs> Ruth, who's in the audience, uh, Ruth looked at So this is not all about schools, families and individuals. So the key point, of course, is that, well, I should get you to say it. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, the key point, of course, is that the problem of education inequalities is caused by society, not by schools. Teachers on their own cannot make all the difference, although they can certainly make a difference. Um, so I think it's acknowledging that there are resources there, but then there is a bigger picture. Without changing some of the system, Getting out with our placards. <laughs> I'm sure that I'm not sure that did a huge amount, but it was good that it sort of felt good in some ways. I think we have to sort of be political beings and sort of um, talk about our values in that sense. And then the final one, which links again back to uh, why is this important? So what is what is what is the thrust behind some of this movement to put mental health in schools? Is it humanistic principles and treating individuals um, as individuals, as people, or is it economic? Oh, you know, are we trying to create a more productive society? Um, you know, we could think about that again. <laughs> is it, what's the reason behind what we do? Um, and if it is, if it is, you know, I think this becomes important. I in some ways, I don't care what the answer to this is, but I think people need to have a little bit of a sense because that changes the goals and it changes the outcome. You know, we can look at, well, as schools become welfare institutions, and know is kind of interested in that, and then, you know, will Ofsted try to acknowledge some of this difference? You know, rather than being so focused on intellectual development, will there be some acceptance of um, other areas? Not that I want them to include a metric that sort of represents that, but I guess thinking about well, what would that mean for a school. Um, and that's it. <laughs> Thanks so much, Terry. Uh, wonderful thought provoking and entertaining. No, as, uh, thank you. Would be. Um, have you got some time for some questions? Yes, yes. I know some people want to go to an Oxfam tour. <laughs> Hi, Terry. Hey, really, really nice to see your take there. I was reminded when I saw your potato plant growing. Oh, yeah. About the kind of nativistic kind of origins of humanistic work. And the fact that you, it's about understanding that the person in front of you has got all this potential, all this inside them that they can apply to problem solving, to learning aspects. And it's almost as though people take that and think, well, that's for well being. Mm -hmm. But actually, if it applies to a potato plant, it's going to apply to every aspect of our learning. Mm. You know, learning mathematics, learning, you know, English, writing, everything. Mm -hmm. And I think what, what strikes me as a real problem is that the education system is still based on this sort of instructionist perspective that you that you educate from the outside. But if if they were kind of 
taking on board that everything is kind of driven from within is a hu is humanistic at heart, mm. and they wouldn't have any difficulty integrating humanistic well-being approaches because it would just be how they taught anyway. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I think that, that idea of saying we've kind of got education, we've got health, and they run separate seems a bit of a fallacy in some senses. Because what's going on with both of them is that they're people adopting the wrong perspective. They think they can impose some kind of, kind of structure or requirements that actually need to be much more sensitive to the individual's mm. goals and strengths and needs. Mm. Yep, yeah. yeah, I <laughs> could talk more about it. Any other questions? Or thoughts? Go on, Miguel. Hi, Terry. Thank you for that. Um, especially because I don't know much about humanistic, for instance, cognitive therapy. Um, I know that you just mentioned um, very recently that you know you're, you're, you probably aren't very comfortable with the idea of introducing metrics. And just this idea of, I think, when policies sort of like spread, I mean, there is, I'm thinking very much about um, something that was in the BBC just this morning about the PISA exam trying to now, um, well, the idea of introducing uh, a test or a kind of indicator for learning about other cultures. It's actually a very interesting metric that no one knows what mm. it will look like. But, but the sense that, yes, you don't, you, you, you're uncomfortable with that, but how, I mean, getting, I suppose, like a wider set of, of actors or wider set of schools or wider set of countries involved is probably a sense of the resilience of, of, of children. Is there a way for that to be, I suppose, scaled up? The idea of, okay, this is, this is, this is the framework by which we can we can scale up the readiness of the school or this particular intervention. Mm. And I think it's very difficult to get away from the, from the idea of how will you know whether that's happening well or not yeah, without, yeah. The, without the sense of a metric. So, so even though you're uncomfortable with it, mm -hmm. if you're going to be in a conversation with a policymaker who would say, well, how are we going to enact this? What would you say? What would I say? Yeah, that's a good point. I'm not, I'm not averse to metrics uh, in the sense of, uh, it, I know sort of Neil's done some interesting stuff and Michael sort of around that sort of area. I, th I think for me there's something that might be more akin to, you know, like the, the, um, the race charter at the university, which is a, a way of working and principles that exist within a context um, that might be indicators of working in a particular way rather than necessarily measuring whether or not they're effective or not. Um, whether or not that... I, I talked to... It was a, I won't name names, an assistant head, and they were very keen on the idea that you could almost have a package that sort of demonstrated that you had certain infrastructure <laughs> in place, and that infra if that was in place, then um, that could almost get you a few, in their mind, they wanted a few, almost exonerated from some Ofsted scrutiny. Does that make sense? But it would be a different way of working rather than necessarily measuring whether or not well-being had improved or decreased. Does that make sense? I don't know if that answers your question or not. Uh, no. It makes me think that if that isn't in place, um, it's, it's more a case of that um, you don't need to measure something happening because if that isn't happening, then all the other good stuff will happen. It's almost, if you turn it about face, that hmm. you don't need to measure it happening. It has to be there. It, it's such a base, going back to Maslow, hmm. it, it, it's such a base kind of requirement to enable people to, to thrive in school, that if it isn't there, then they won't enjoy and achieve. Yeah. So why do you need to measure it? Yeah, I suppose that would be a very humanistic perspective, is sort of try and create the environment, and the environment would be the like, kind of important element rather than necessarily the outcome. Like Carl Rogers talks about the idea of life being a, a process, or, or things, therapy being a process rather than a destination. Mm -hmm. So you, you're constantly learning, you're constantly growing. And, um, I guess it's more about providing that that environment for that growth to occur in. Again, I don't think I've answered your question. <laughs> okay, if you think about social mobility, you know, uh -huh. think about education and social mobility, intergenerational social mobility, you go to school, you get qualifications, and hopefully you'll do a job that society needs, you'll earn money, uh -huh. and then you'd be able to maybe bring up the next generation better, better supported, financed, roof and uh, over their head, fed, etc., etc. So do you think it's a failure of education which has not made parents be able to provide the goods for their children in order to in order for us to have these issues in education right now? Really? Yeah. So has education, failure of education led to the well being issues that we are facing today and training teachers are facing today? That's a big question. 
<laughs> I, I, and I would probably, I'd, there has to, there are ripples for me, and you know, I, I think so. Sort of blaming education or blaming schools wouldn't be. Uh, I don't think that would be a helpful uh, perspective for me. Um, I think there's much more of a societal kind of thing that's going on in terms of investment and valuing and um, valuing education and valuing that sort of uh, that environment, which is about trying to develop people to reach their potential rather than. Um, to have them fearful of doing wrong, which is that more kind of conditioning kind of perspective. I don't know, but I, would, I think it's a bigger um, kind of question than maybe education. I'm just thinking, you know, where do you draw the line between encouraging somebody to get the qualification to go to university, we all know what the university agenda is like, etc. Yeah, yeah. To get that social mobility in order to improve the quality of your life, it needs to be, and what expense does that come at, really? Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But I've no idea what the answer to that question would be. I was Can just I talking about that. that. <laughs> Can I respond to that? I mean, just yeah. what you said about qualification, because what we've got now, I mean, is that latest report saying from Austin that so much is focused on schools getting the best qualifications, the highest number. So therefore, then what happens is you've got children with special education needs, you've got the highest number of exclusions of black young people. You're actually being forced out of that system because actually it's based on qualifications and the social mobility is about how well is our school doing in terms of the number of GCSEs we get this year, it squeezes out all those children don't fit. So yeah. that, that's the cost, I think. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm aware some people are nipping out because the, the research manager of Oxfam is talking across the road. <laughs> so if you want to go, that's fine. Okay, thank you.